think it would hit me like that. <laughs> I've been up on this stage uh, many a times, and this is something. Hey, people in the balcony. <laughs> I tell you what, I've been here for the last couple of days, and it has felt like being home, y'all. So thank you so much for welcoming me back. It is so good to see all of you, and thank you for showing up this morning, especially students. <laughs> you have a few options for convocation, and thank you for coming to this one. <laughs> um, I was thinking, you know, I've been thinking for the last couple of months about this when we nailed this down that I would be here and talking to the students, and I've been going over in my mind, what is it that I want to say to you? What is it that I could share with you from my journey that will hopefully inspire you? And not only that, give you some wisdom as you begin yours. Uh, I'll just give you a quick background of where I came from. Uh, born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas. Country as they get. Yes, that's me. Uh, and I went to a high school that had majors. So when I went into high school, my major was business law. Now y'all, I went into this accounting class and thought I was going to kill everybody in there. <laughs> because I hated it. Not disliked it. Not, I, I won't make it through it. I hated it. The teacher didn't like me because she knew I didn't want to be there. So I was like, life has got to be better than this because this is not what I'm setting up to do. So I went into the theater department and I began operating a spotlight. Well, after that, she talked me into auditioning for a play. My first play was Inherit the Wind, playing Matthew Harrison Ray. So this was a UIL 1A play, which in Texas you have the competition, so you go and uh, you compete against other schools and you go from area to zone to region to state. And so we went pretty far with the show. We were winning all-star cast awards, best actor awards, here in my first show. And at the time, all I'm thinking is, I'm loving this. Every moment of this. I'm loving the 12-hour work days. I'm loving the stress, I'm loving the pressure, I'm loving all of this. This is what I want to do. Bit by the bug, as they say. So I go home and tell my parents, yeah, y'all know that business law major thing that I had? Well, no, not anymore, I want to be an actor. <laughs> yeah, go home and tell your parents that. <laughs> my parents, being the lovely, supportive people that they are, said, okay, baby. That's what you want to do. Now, they told me years later, they also went to their bedroom, sat on the bed together, and said, we're going to have to support him for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until I decided I needed to take this further. College was, it was not an option not to go to college. That was just the next step for me. And so once I began looking for schools, I was actually looking at the University of Central Florida. 5,000 students alone in their theater department. Well, yeah, that didn't sound too appealing. <laughs> you know, I don't care how good you are, I don't care how much you want it, I don't care how much you want to learn. When you're in a department full of 5,000 students, it's limited. So I went to a college day, and who did I discover? Sterling College, in the middle of Kansas. Now, remember, y'all, I just told my parents, I won't be an actor. They don't understand when you come home and say, I think I found a school. And she was like, well, what is it? Well, that's great. Sterling College. Well, where is it? In Sterling, Kansas. <laughs> well, where is that? <laughs> About an hour and a half in Wichita, Kansas. Cut through Hutchison. <laughs> right before you get to lives. <laughs> that was the explanation they gave me. And so that was the explanation I gave her. <laughs> Because she's trying to put my mom and my dad trying to put this together in their mind. You're going to leave Texas, go to Kansas, and this is going to help you become that. <laughs> Don't ask me. Talk to the Lord because he's doing all this. <laughs> so, I come up, I do an audition with Gordon and Diane right here on this stage. I think I was standing actually right there because I remember that plug is my mark when I did my monologues. And after that, we went up and we talked and they offered me a scholarship and kind of went over to admissions and we kind of started this process. You know, I knew this is what I wanted, this is where I was coming. And 
I guess the biggest thing that you learn is, as this journey is happening, all I know is that all of this feels right. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know what this means. This just feels right. Like I'm walking where I'm supposed to walk. So I come here, live it up in Sterling, Kansas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those midnight runs with Molly and Luke to Sonic. <laughs> yeah, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. And so come here for four and a half years. And I'm on this stage, left and right, in and out. We live in this theater. Now, I was a little strange, y'all. I lived in Kilbert Hall as a theater man. Yeah. <laughs> and every night, I wanted to, I would come here, and we would get to rehearse, and we would get to learn, and do all of this. And I got to leave this world and go over and be with the fellas. You know what I mean? And hang out and, and all of that. And I'll share with you in just a moment how that has affected my life now, because that's exactly how I do, how I see Hollywood. I go work, I love it, I choose it, then I say good night, and I go home and I hang out with the fellas. You know what I mean? I hang out with my friends and my family. So Hollywood, that's my job. It's a fun job. I love it. I get to be on TV. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I get to go with me to a playground every day. But this work doesn't define all the plan. So to go back a little bit. After Sterling College, I could go into detail, but I'll tell y'all that. You don't want to hear every show I was in, everything that I did. I <laughs> After that, I went to the best semesters going to, study, uh, to the LAFSC, the Los Angeles Film Studies Center. That changed my life as far as my career. Now, when I wanted to do this, I had to come to Gordon and Diane and get recommendations, and then I had to uh, write an essay about what I wanted. I really had to think about that at the time. Like I sat in the Gilbert basement and I thought about that in and out, in and out. You know, I was in my friend's room just and they were like, what's wrong, what's wrong? I'm like, I have to think, I have to think, you know. <laughs> you know. And all I knew was, okay, I want a career as an actor. I want to be a full-time working actor. So we have to figure out how to do that. And so, I wrote that to the people. I let them know, this is what I want to do. I want to be a working actor in the industry, bringing who I am, what I know, and I want to affect people. Whether it be to make them laugh, whether it be to make them think, whether it be to make them change something in themselves, I want to affect people in a way that when they leave my presence in whatever way that is, they're a little bit better from that moment. I talked about that in my essay to the LAFSC, so I got in, so it worked. Ooh. <laughs> I went out to Los Angeles Film Space Center. Here I am in the middle of Hollywood. Now, let me give you a quick rundown of how we got there. I had a 1993 Ford Taurus. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> yes, it looked like the car was marble because it was painted. And yes, the ceiling did come down so it looked like I had curtains in the back. <laughs> so, so here we are. It's after the summer. It's time for me to drive out to California with my dad. 23 hours straight. Here we go for the desert. You know, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't know what. Woo. So here we go. We get to Beaumont, California, two and a half hours outside of LA. And the transmission blows. <laughs> we are rolling, and we are not shifting gears at all. <laughs> so we roll right off the exit, parked in a gas station. Now, my poor dad, as he's trying to figure out what's wrong with the car, has this blubbering idiot sitting to the right of him, going, I knew it. I knew it. I'm telling y'all, this is a sign I'm not supposed to come <laughs> My dad looks at me, dead in my eyes, and he's like, oh, no, buddy. If he was going to give us a sign, he'd have did it 23 hours ago. <laughs> Motel. <laughs> Three rooms had doors on it. 
<laughs> they were remodeling, I don't know what they were doing. The rest of the rooms didn't have doors. So they put us in a room with a door. <laughs> so we had to wait until the next morning to talk to the man about fixing the transmission to the mechanic. So we do this, and then my dad gets a rental car, and we drive two and a half hours so I can make it to California. And as soon as you come down the hill, you see Warner Brothers, and you see Disney, and you see Universal, you know, and oh, all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to be here. The Lord's back. <laughs> I want to stay. You know what I mean? And my dad was like, I do. Once you saw this, you will want to stay. So, it was, long story short, here I am now. My dad leaves the rental car. I take to the airport. He flies back. And then I'm in California. So let's begin this journey. Now, not only do you take class at the best semester, you take filmmaking, producing. Uh, at the time, it was a class called Faith, Film, and Culture how you uh, bring your faith into this industry and to your work and all of this. And so you do that, but you also do an internship. And so the first time I went out for my internship uh, interview, it was in the backyard with tiki torches all around in the mud. Now they told us, you know, in Hollywood, some offices are in people's houses in the backyard, you know, so you may work at someone's house. This is not what I expected. <laughs> I got mud on my shoes, y'all. <laughs> and I got a resume and I'm trying to be professional, but this is hard. And then all I see is a shed with a few movie posters. And this woman comes out and she's like, well, um, can you input information into the computer? Yes, ma'am, I can. Well, when can you start? <laughs> so I had to get my lie together. Because I was like, oh no, I can't, uh, we have to work this lie out. Because Lord, you're going to forgive me for this one. I'm not coming to this place anyway. So once again, I tell the Lord, I need to talk to my professors. I need to, you know, they have to approve this just to get out of there. So I go back to her, and once again, here I am blubbering again, y'all. I cried a lot when I first got to LA. I'm <laughs> and I go in and I explain to her, I know you said, you know, working in someone's house. I know this is a, all of this, but it was mud and ticket touches that I don't want to do it, and this is awful. And she was like, well, that's not what I meant. She was like, let's call around and find you another internship. So she called the place that I ended up staying at, which was Monica Swan Casting. And at the time, they were casting the Parkers, the Bernie Mac Show, Girlfriends, Proud Family, you know, a lot of black shows. Uh, they were the casting directors. And so, she called, took one phone call, and she said, I have a student from Texas, and we would love for him to come interview, you know, to intern in your office. And the assistant on the phone said, well, he doesn't need an interview. We'll take it. And she said, well, you don't want to talk to him? She's like, he can come by so we can meet him, and we can let him know, you know, where he's coming, and we'll see him Monday to start, so he can just stop by and say hello. So I go and stop by and say hello, and they didn't want an interview. They just said, hello. You know, but very nice to meet you. And they're like, we don't know why. We said yes to you because we've been getting calls all day about people with internships. So something about your teacher calling and the way she explained it and explained the program. And I just love that. Monica, we have this guy that sounds promising. She's like, yes, we should take it. Done. So I start Monday. I go in. First thing I do is empty the trash. I'm thinking, this is what they want me to do. They want me to empty the trash and vacuum, and you know, this is what an intern does. And they stop me and go, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm doing what an intern does. You know, they're like, no, we can bring you here to do our labor. We actually want to teach you. So long story short, I ended up getting one of the best internships out of the program. So much so that this is where I learned I need to go to grad school. I was not ready to jump into this business. But all the things that I have learned, all the actors that I've seen, all of this that I've known, I am not ready to compete with this. There's a level that I felt I want to go to, and I'm not there. So I go in, I'm nervous, and I tell her because they've offered to help me, you know, get an agent, get representation, support my career, you know, and I tell her, I'm like, well, I'm not ready. I want to go to grad school. I have a semester to go back and record a new show. And then after that, I think I need to go to grad school and train some more. She was so proud. She was like, well, you know we are here. For that, I'll write your recommendations. For that, I'll do whatever you need. Just let us know. So long story short, I end up at UC Irvine. After a long audition process of Irvine, goes well. I want to be on the West Coast. I want to be near Hollywood. 
I go through this program for three years, and then I graduate, and we have a showcase in both New York and LA. Now, this is where you take all that hard work, and you see if anyone is interested. Well, I, I was blessed enough to come out of showcase and both on both coasts, able to choose a commercial agent, a theatrical agent, and a manager, decide where I wanted to be. Well, it was LA. So I came out of showcase with a commercial agent, a theatrical agent, and the manager ready to hit it. And also meetings with the studios, because they also come. So head of casting of CBS, head of casting of NBC, of Paramount, of Warner Brothers. I had, I'm just going meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, eating Subway in between. <laughs> you know, that was the journey as we begin this. So, I start doing small co-stars, guest stars, but I'm working the full year and a half out of school. And then I'm going for this last minute audition for a working man, is all it told us. He's a working man, so wear your dickies, and we will see you then. I show up, and lo and behold, yes, it is the Miller High Life commercial. <laughs> So I go in, they don't even have me say anything. They just want to see if I can move beer on the hand truck. <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh, okay, this is simple. Well, that's how you got to the callback. So the callback, they give me one line, and it's step aside more than me. So I'm going to think, well, what in the world? Step aside more than me? Like, highlight and French. This is not connected. <laughs> and so that's exactly what, what I played in the room. I was like, he doesn't know French. This man is trying to get in here, get his stuff so he can get out. You know, and exactly, this is exactly how I said, step aside, more me, I need to get in. <laughs> so I did that, and after that, they got the improv improv. And so, lo and behold, I get three commercials at once. So I was only talking in one, I get to say, like, oh, no, you do. You talking to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we get three commercials. Well, the commercials air for about a month or two, and they get a request. People want to meet you. So what do you mean people want to meet me? You know, I did a commercial. We've been getting requests. People want to meet you. They want to meet the Miller High Life Mission. So we're going to try this thing with eight appearances. And we're going to see if this works. They didn't know about the sub, Free Madonna from L.A., you know, who didn't want to talk to people. You know, all they know was shots in commercials. So we did two weeks on the road. Let me just say, we're in 2012. Y'all, and I'm still doing appearances, personal appearances, <laughs> around the country. Here we go. This is something that is, at least in Hollywood standards, something that's unheard of. You know what I mean? Like a campaign to take off like this, but not only the commercials are doing well, but trips around the country. I just got back from Super Bowl. I'm still recuperating from that. <laughs> you know? But trips around the country meeting people. Now, uh, from the, these commercials, my career takes off. This is what's getting me in rooms, left and right. People didn't even know my name. They'd be like, yeah, we have one of the we want you to see him. We think he'd be right for this role. Who is Wendell Mill Brooks? <laughs> they don't know Wendell Mill Brooks. And they were like, you know the big black dude in the highlight commercial? <laughs> 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 like, yeah. They were like, yeah, we know him. Send him in. Yeah, we're going to come in. You know what I mean? I was like, that's how you should pitch me. Forget the name. This is the big black dude in the highlight commercial. They said, that's exactly what they wanted. What I went in for body proof, which I'm on now. Now, uh, just to step back, for Sweet Life, I went in for this. This was supposed to be a one time, you know, one episode that I was supposed to jump on and play a security guard. Well, I go in now, I'm already highlight dude, and then we're doing Sweet Life on deck. This is on Disney. Y'all see, I'm like, I won't mention highlight, I won't mention anything. I'm just going in audition, and we'll see what happens. So I'm trying to hide it, thinking, oh my gosh, you know, because I really like this role. But will this conflict? You know, and so I go into the audition. They want me to come do it. I get to set, and I'm still not mentioning anything. You know, I'm just I'm ready to work. And all the writers come down. They're like, "We've been watching your commercials upstairs." <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. They're like, "This is how we got inspiration to write for you." You know, we hear your rhythm. We hear all of this and stuff. I was like, "Oh, so it's okay." This one mentioned. They're like, "Oh yeah, it's fine. Come on, you live in the street life too. You've been living the high life. Come live in the street." <laughs> Here we are. This is the DCF group, the same thing for body group, which I'm on right now. Now, I just want to give you a little rundown of my journey because, as you can see, it doesn't make sense at all. 
The journey that I'm still on, doesn't, it never makes sense. I can never put it together like a puzzle and say this, this, this. But the one thing that I do have is an open heart and a willing heart to go where he tells me to go. And he is God. Make it very clear. My career is where he's gotten me to be. Building my career, he has never stopped building my character as a person. Actually, he does it at the same time, every time. Because I want to give you the fun and how I got there and on TV and all of these things, and I wanted to share that with you, but I also want to let you know that when you're called to do something great, what makes it great? You're called to do it. It's that simple. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how small it is. It's great because he's called you to do it, and he wants you to do it on a level that represents him. God is not mediocre, y'all. He is not mediocre. He is not small, at least not the God that I serve. And that's who I'm representing in everything I do. And that right there makes it great. Not me. Because I couldn't have done any of this without him. I'm just the open vessel letting him use me. In ways that I would have never imagined. But I want to share with you some times that have been rough in my life. Now, it's Black History Month. And I thought about talking about Martin Luther King. You know, I love Martin. I wouldn't be standing here talking to you if it wasn't for Martin. This man led a movement. You know what I mean? A movement to open the eyes of people so that we could see beyond our ignorance. All of us. But the person I want to talk to you about today, you wouldn't know his name. He's not in any books. You won't see him flash up on the TV screen. Let's celebrate him for Black History Month. This man didn't even finish the 10th grade. This was my grandfather. I had a big daddy and a big mom, y'all. Now, my big daddy was the closest thing to Jesus walking on this earth. And so, even though he didn't have a college degree, he always supported me and was so proud to push me to go to the extra level. The main thing that he taught me that I carry in my work, that I carry in my life. If he walked in here today, now, I really hope he doesn't, because we buried him in 2008. <laughs> so if he walks in this room, y'all on your own, because I'm here today. <laughs> let you know. But, so let's just, you know, I'm telling you, if he walked in here today, and the CEO of one company, CEO of the company walked up to him, he would treat him the exact same way as the janitor cleaning the building. He would not change. You wouldn't see him get more excited for one than the other. Title didn't mean anything to him. Character did as a person. He would tell you that everyone has a purpose, has their place, and the CEO can't run his company if it's not clean. Everything is needed. At once. So don't you make that difference in people. You respect them. Now, as I told you, Sweet Life. When I did Sweet Life, it started off, I was very excited, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then my poor grandfather went to the hospital on the Wednesday of this week, my first time. Doing sweet Life, <coughs> stepping onto this set and we begin this journey. So I get a call on Wednesday morning. From my mom said, we had to take him to the hospital. You know, uh, you know, it's not looking real good. So you should call him. Well, something in me said, call him as soon as you get to your dressing room. Before you step on stage, just call him. <coughs> so I called him, and he was having trouble breathing. You know, he had breathing issues and stuff. And so I talked to him, and I was like, well, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm pretty good. He would never tell you I'm bad. You know, especially when the girl was on the show, and he didn't want to get me. I said, well, I'm pretty good, but you could hear what's happening. Breathe. So it was a short conversation. And I said, well, I'm going to let you go so you can relax, you know, and I don't want you breathing too hard and stuff. And I said, I love you. He's like, I love you too. And that was the last time that I spoke to my grandfather. The Friday before my first live taping studio audience, you know, that morning, he passed away. I was in my dressing room. Another thing, same scenario. Here I am in 
Green Bay, Wisconsin. My godmother, who had been dying of cancer. I get to get love. She came to us, she told us, the King Bowl for the third time, I can't do it. So I want to live my life to the fullest, to the end. So you have to accept that. And I had to accept that. The day she passed away, 10, 16 in the morning, I had just pulled up to Green Bay, Wisconsin, with about a thousand people standing outside of a sign waiting for me. Media's there, cameras are there, and my sister calls at that moment. I'm, we just pull up. She's like, well, she's gone. I had to get it together. I had to go into, into that sign. Nobody knew when anything was wrong. Sweet life, I had to shoot that whole night before I could fly in and deal with that. I tell you that because I want you to see the glamour, see the fun, see all the things, but I also want you to know when you're called to do something great, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's going to be downright hard. Two times that it was the hardest thing I ever had to do was put the, I guess, put myself, the grief that I had to deal with, to put that on the back burner, to go do what I needed to do. Because one, that's what both of those people who talk so much would want, me, would want me to do. And then also, that's life, y'all. <laughs> life happens and we keep going. So today, what I want you to understand is when you're called to do something great, Yes, it will be amazing. It will be, it will represent God on a level that you couldn't imagine. This also, sometimes this is going to be hard. It's going to be rough moments. It's going to be times when you want to throw in the towel and you're like, I am done with this. But you have to keep going. One of my favorite scriptures is Ephesians 3.20. You've heard it. He's able to do it seemingly in front of you above anything you can ask to think. Well, y'all, my whole life, evidently, has been Ephesians 3.20. But a new perspective came into play. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you ask or think. But he expects exceedingly abundantly from you anything that you can ask or think. You reap what you sow. He is willing to give that to you. But he expects every bit of it right back. If you don't take anything else from that today, start sowing right now. Start learning who you are, the passion that's in you. What is it that you want to do? Don't just exist. Live life to the fullest. Imagine who we're celebrating in Black History Month if they would have just existed. Didn't have a passion. Didn't push. Imagine Martin Luther King like, well, you know, we need, we need Y'all stop riding the bus. You know, uh, y'all want to march. Y'all feel like marching. I don't feel like marching. We're not marching. Imagine that mediocre attitude. Do everything on a level that is great. Simply because you were called to do it. That's what makes it.